Center, which stands for the Research in Palliative and End-of-Life Communication and Training. Um, I'm Susan Hickman. I co-direct that center along with Greg Sachs um, and Joan Hazy. And um, we focus on um, trying to improve palliative and end-of-life care through the use of evidence and collaboration with community partners. Um, uh, I am really also excited today because this lecture is not only co-sponsored by the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics and the Respect Center, but by the K. Woltman um, Endowed Lectureship, which is a gift of um, uh, Mr. Richard Woltman, an IU alum, who uh, had a personal experience that really moved him to um, think about how he could take that experience and improve the lives of other families dealing with um, difficult uh, illness and end-of-life decision-making. Um, so he made a gift to the IU School of Nursing that helped support this lectureship today as well. Uh, this lecture is being recorded and broadcasted today. So again, I want to thank those who are joining us from IU Health Arnett, IU Ball Memorial, and IU Health West. I'm going to ask everyone in all sites to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Um, if you do need to answer a call, please leave the auditorium to do so. Um, I also am uh, instructed to share that Dr. Sally Norton, our um, wonderful guest speaker today, has no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, we're friends. We're, and, well, that is a conflict of interest, <laughs> isn't it? But I don't know if it's relevant, but we are friends. Um, I am really delighted to have Sally here. I've known her for, oh my gosh, we're not a coming. really long time. And um, uh, we, we both uh, uh, worked at uh, Oregon Health and Science University uh, back many years ago when Sally was a postdoc um, and I was a project manager, actually. And uh, since that time, we've both gone our separate ways but stayed in touch, so I was really delighted when we were able to um, get Sally to come visit. She's been doing some really excited, exciting and innovative work um, nationally and uh, is a really uh, well-known and well-respected nurse scientist um, in the field of uh, palliative and end-of-life uh, care, particularly around decision-making. Um, uh, Dr. Norton, I should give you the official um, uh, introduction, is a tenured associate professor of nursing at the University of Rochester in New York. Um, she has secondary appointments in the medical humanities and family medicine de um, departments at University of Rochester and is the Independence Foundation Chair in Nursing and Palliative Care. Um, she is really focused and dedicated to improving the care of patients with advanced illness. And her very well-established program research reflects this. It's focused on palliative care and end-of-life decision-making, as I said, um, with a really interesting emphasis on the communication processes and practice patterns of care delivery. Um, and she focuses both in the acute as well as long-term care settings. Um, she today is going to share with us some really uh, fascinating work that she's been doing with the American Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association around identifying um, quality measures. Uh, one of the uh, new, sort of, I, th I think, I feel like it's relatively new in palliative care. There's been such a long uh, push to just try and get people to uh, try and implement um, different palliative care interventions and, and develop palliative care programs that now we're at the point where people are starting to talk about how do we evaluate these. Um, to continue moving the field forward, what indicators are we going to use to assess quality, um, and Sally has been um, leading the charge on the development of that nationally, and so she's going to talk with us today about um, the work that she's done with a national task force called Measuring What Matters, um, and uh, um, I'm really excited to hear her recommendations today uh, and her advice and guidance around uh, moving the field forward. So, that that's pretty comprehensive. Yes. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Dr. Norton. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. And the visit has been fabulous. And um, I really appreciate the time and effort um, Amy and Laura and everyone put into putting my schedule together. So thank you for being here. Um, I am an informal presenter, which sometimes gets me into trouble when things get recorded. So I will try to be on my best behavior. But I would also ask, I'm very interested in hope to finish um, with at least 10 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, um, I'm very happy to talk about this stuff. Because stuff at the end, the information that I'll be providing at the end really is in areas where we have no consensus yet. So they're fraught with uh, contesting opinions, kind of like ethics, um, and sometimes dilemmas, sometimes a little heated, sometimes not, but it is the world that we work in, in um, and we have to navigate that. So it's 
best to have the open conversation and questions about it. Um, so it's sort of like I want to start with a funny thing happened to me on the way to the bar. But um, it, they called me to, um, I've been working with a hospice and palliative care nurses association. I've been past um, involved heavily in the research interest group. Um, and apparently when this call came out is we were going to have and develop a joint task force. HPNA was asked to name a representative. Um, and when they called me, I sort of laughed. I was like, measurement. You know, primarily I am a qualitative mixed methods person. I'm really not heavy duty into measurement. I appreciate the skill set. It's not mine. Um, and they said, well, what we really need is the conceptual work um, that goes beyond the actual technical aspects and begins to pull out what are the common themes. I was like, oh, common themes, I'm getting, I'm getting warm here. I really can begin to see where my role might be in this committee. Um, so I said yes, and sometimes I wonder, but um, I want to first acknowledge and or blame. Uh, anything you don't like would belong to, no. Um, I am working with a terrific group of people, and none of us um, really has um, worked together very much. Uh, so I co-chair this committee with Dave Kasseret from UPenn. Uh, Sydney D. and Susan McMillan have been phenomenal in helping guide the technical advisory panel, and as have Keila Herr and uh, Joe Rotella from the Academy and from HPNA respectively. And the support that we've gotten from both the Academy and HPNA, um, Catherine and Dale and June, just been phenomenal, and this moves forward because of the support uh, staff who, who keep us in line, uh, keep us organized, get us from A to B, I'm looking at Laura, um, but really help make the structure of things happen so that we can do the work that we do. So I want to acknowledge them. Um, full disclosures, there are really no relevant financial relationships uh, to disclose in this. What I we'll do today is talk about a rationale for the Academy and the Joint Task Force for Measuring What Matters, tell you a little bit about what it is, um, talk about some common issues in palliative care that hinder national benchmarking and the concern about national benchmarking, period, and then um, really want you to take away from this, if you're in clinical care or work with the clinical care service, really like you to take away from this a couple ideas from the handout that you have that actually has a list of measures on it with hot links. Um, you can go to the Academy website and get the actual hot links that work, um, but that there are real measures in here that people are beginning to use, so please, please avail yourself of those measures, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so the goal of measuring what matters is to really begin as a field. We're, we were all over the place. People were measuring really what mattered in their own particular setting. Um, it's hard to find. It's like, what should I measure? Oh, we have to do performance improvement. I don't know. And then somebody like me would say, oh, go to the library. Well, then you'd go to the library and find 15 measures on treatment preferences. <clears throat> um, and and you, what do you do, right? I want one project. I want something discrete, feasible, um, that, that I, I won't spend a lifetime doing, but I really want to know how we're doing in our system. So we kept hearing that, hearing that, and hearing that, and we had no consensus as a field. Um, so our goal was to s develop a set of measures that were rigorous, meaningful, um, and could be used across many settings, you know, because the heterogeneity of palliative and hospice care, we don't have a specific group. We don't have a specific setting. We don't, I mean, we have kids, we have old people, we have people in the middle. Um, it's really hard, people in long-term care, people at home, people in the hospital. Uh, it's really hard to begin to think, what are the core components that travel across those groups and that travel across those settings? And um, I especially want to fully disclose that we really struggled when it came to kids. Um, and I would say that was one of the issues that we have. Um, and I know some of that work right now is in development, so uh, we will keep working on that. Um, so in the short term, and really the focus of this project is to have people have a set of recommended measures that they can use internally uh, with their own organizations, right? So you can identify and measure 
Um, you can identify problems that you have. You can put them in a performance improvement plan, and hopefully you can improve the treatment of the patients um, that you serve and their families. The issue really becomes in the longer term, when you think about nationally what's moving on, um, how do we as a field develop some shared experiences? How as we as a field begin to develop, how can we compare our systems of delivery? Which one, which system works better? Which team construction works better? Which group works better? What group works better in what setting? We don't know because we can't compare. We can compare oranges and apples right now together. And that really kind of comes up with um, a fruit salad that's not very helpful. Um, at the same time, we have several registries right now that are available to people. And um, it's like, is there a registry? No. CMS has this data, right? In the, with hospice data, uh, CAPSI has data, the Center to Advance Palliative Care. There is a QDACT, which I don't remember the acronyms. Um, and then a group out in UCSF, Steve Panelat, has quality data. So there are several really good repositories nationally. We're all using different data. Um, so it's good within the repository. It's not so good if we really want to start comparing um, across settings. So the other issue, nobody's ever seen the triple aim before, right? Um, uh, higher quality patient care, healthier populations, lower costs. Um, what does higher quality patient care look like, right? And who's going to be the person that says what's higher quality palliative care? And that was kind of a, the little fear motivating factor is, is that is someone else besides patients, families, and clinicians really going to start um, defining what quality is for us or are we going to do it for ourselves? And it's sort of the benefits and burdens of each and then the lesser of the two um, was that maybe we should really begin to do this for ourselves um, because so much stuff is happening nationally. It is mind-boggling. Um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, CMS regulations, um, the really what we're seeing, tremendous healthcare system consolidation, um, integrating, integrating post-acute care into the continuum. Things that we haven't done before and haven't thought about before are happening now. So it's, um, and then the last one I'll spend a little bit more time talking about is this idea of value-based purchasing, which is emerging nationally. I'm not sure how much it's infiltrated in Indianapolis. Um, one of my colleagues in Boston says basically their hospitals are only contracting with um, hospices that have can demonstrate that they provide high-value care, really top quality care and efficiently. And the people that don't have a performance, a robust performance improvement plan in place are not getting those subcontracts. They are not getting patients to them. So, so this is happening regardless of um, our desire to participate in it or not. Um, and you know the equation, quality over cost. So our goal was to really begin to focus on what is the quality? Can we begin to measure it? Can we at least as a field agree um, on where we're going to go? So over the years, there are a whole bunch of reasons why we want to measure quality. Um, we started out, and I participated in some of this work, we have to justify the need for a palliative care program. Who's our stakeholder? Oh, who's the business person who's going to write in to really, because we're not really a money generating group. Um, we might save money, but no one's going to believe we save money. So we might have to justify that. Um, so performance improvement helps us really demonstrate where we need improvement. And I think, um, I like to think that, you know, we have a terrific group. We provide wonderful care for people. And then you hear the story about the gap. Like, and, and you just, your heart just breaks. It's like, oh. Um, and then if you hear a second story, you begin to think, oh, maybe there's a pattern. We identified an issue with hospice patients who, who um, didn't end up in our hospice unit inpatient and didn't, uh, their pain scores started to go off the charts within the first 24 to 48 hours because their old treatment thing got dumped and admission records didn't have the new one. And, um, you know, we were doing a really bad job managing 
the pain of hospice patients who weren't in our inpatient setting or weren't being seen by palliative care. It's a problem. Um, so it helps us do an awful lot of things. Um, so the opportunity, we've got a lot of things out there. Um, I said 15 measures, of, that, that sort of stands out there. I'm looking at Susan when I say that. Um, but what are the ones we can agree on that are useful? And, and thinking of a clinician, and if I hand um, a clinician a 20 item measure, they're just gonna do this. Um, and then they're gonna laugh and then they're gonna just kind of walk away, like oh, get away from her, she's a little bit off her rocker. Um, Cause we're not gonna do that, right? So there's a, this is hard work and it takes time and it takes um, often in a lot of organizations, it's clinician time. Um, and there are really few palliative care measures included in the national, some of the national quality programs. Um, so I mentioned what do we mean by this um, and what I wanted to show you here is this is the website that you can go to even if you just Google measuring what matters AAHPM you will find um, a lot of this information and then links to some of the resources that I'll talk about. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we did um, and I think that uh, when you begin to look at what we should pick. It's like there are a huge array of items. Um, so we decided from the beginning that we would use what we've already done that maps out what are the domains of palliative care. This is our field's work. This is our field setting out what, um, what constitute the nine domains of palliative care through the National Consensus Project. Um, so the tap in the cup I often thought of it as a bar. Um, and now this is my second reference to a bar, so I'm a little bit worried. Um, but the TAP was the Technical Advisory Panel. So what they did was really rated the published measures on their scientific soundness. And then the CUP, the Clinical User Panel, um, we had to settle on what are our criteria for using a measure? Really, where are we going to fall that we can all agree on? And one is, is it's meaningful to patients and families. Um, and that really was often, I mean, the nice thing about working in groups with palliative care and hospice, we often have shared goals. We fight about how to get there, but we really have a shared passion toward improving the experience um, and the care delivered to patients and families who have serious illness. Um, is it meaningful to them? Is it actionable? Like, if I do something different, will it make a difference? So there are some terrific measures out there that I cannot help. Um, as a clinician, um, if I do my job better, it still won't help. Um, so is it actionable for um, palliative care? And how large is the potential impact, right? If we really embrace some of these, um, can we really think about using them in a broad group? group of populations? Or is this a common experience of many of the people that we see? Um, so over time, and I'll talk a little bit um, um, about what we did, we, we culled from about 150 measures to really 75 that fit within the domains of the National Consensus Project Guidelines. Um, they went to the Technical Advisory Panel and they narrowed those to the 34 technically strongest measures. And then we began to match domain, strongest measures. So some domains that are important about treatment preferences had a lot of strong measures um, and we got rid of most of them. Um, some domains that I'll, I'll mention don't, don't have any very strong measures. So those are research opportunities if you're a student um, or someone who's looking for a gap in the literature. Um, so what do HPNA and Academy members say? What do members of patient organizations say? Um, we send it to patients, the patient organizations like AA, um, AARP, it's like a patient or uh, like people organization, um, and to really try to tap into whether we're consistent with um, patients and families in ways that we could, in ways that we're still related to what we do as healthcare clinicians. Um, and then through a ranking process and sorting and voting, we prioritized the top 10 measures. 
So two of the NCP domains, the social aspects of care and the cultural aspects of care, we didn't come to a consensus. Um, that we really didn't feel that we could recommend um, any of the measures out there for our purposes. Again, it doesn't mean there aren't terrific measures out there. It just might have meant that, gosh, here's a really good measure, but what can we do as clinicians to begin to identify that or to begin to affect change in that domain? Um, very few truly cross-cutting measures. And a lot of the work that we've done has been, uh, oh, older adults, oh, cancer patients, oh, heart failure patients, right? So. So trying to find out, do we think that this might be useful in a cross-cutting population? And we did look for that. Um, and then there is a problem, which I will come back to, which is the denominator problem that we started calling the denominator problem. So whenever it was like code for, oh, here comes the denominator problem again. Um, in your handout, you have our 10 our top 10, um, and here is the citation that was in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management um, in March, I believe, of this year. So we'll talk, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and talk uh, about the so what, right? So, so we've done this as a field, and it's not just so that we had this exercise of um, intellectual curiosity and consensus building. Um, it really is so that people use them in their own setting. Um, and what we found, and there'll be a, actually another survey coming about to begin to understand the performance improvement development needs of hospice and palliative care uh, folks. Um, because what we heard when we talked to people are like, well, how do we do this? What do we do? And um, I'll talk a little bit. People are making this harder than it has to be. So I'm like, oh, keep it easy, keep it easy. And I, I talked to students this morning about feasible and focus, feasible, focus, feasible, focus. Think of those two things. Um, and it's the same with performance improvement. Um, so everybody's, most people are familiar with the Plan, Do, Study, Act. Um, I get a little confused, kind of like, oh, what goes first? Um, but when you think about a plan, I tend to still go back to who do I want to sample in my setting. Now, this is in my setting. And for us, we have this group of people, for example, new hospice admissions who, or hospice admissions who aren't into our palliative care. What, what am I going to do with that? Um, or you may have a subsample of patients on one unit that you're seeing, that you're seeing that are consistent issues or um, so what, what am I interested in? What is the problem? Um, is it when? when? When should I do this? Is there a particular point in somebody's illness trajectory that's more important or less important to begin to sample, um, et cetera? And, and we know nationally that there are a lot of existing requirements and more are coming on the way, but hospice, we're suggesting they start with the hospice item set. So there is some convergence, and I'll point those out where there's convergence with what's already um, in existence. And for palliative care, um, the, we have worked closely. Both people become skeptical when you're working with the Joint Commission, right? The Joint Commission. Well, you're working with them. They're the enforcers. What are you going to do to me? Um, but the Joint Commission has been very open to say, hey, look, we do advanced palliative care certification. We need help because we're going into places, and places are saying, well, what should we use as a measure of performance improvement quality? We need to have some. And the Joint Commission has felt like, well, there isn't a shared standard nationally. So they were very excited to um, participate in this work. Uh, and we're working very hard to align um, state, regional, and other efforts with these indicators. So I always, always say keep it simple. Um, and when you go to your link at a particular measure, really look carefully at the measure definition. Now, here's the, if it's at all possible, don't change it. If it's not possible, change it. Um, and what I'm really saying is right now, we're using these for uh, our own performance improvement. If it's more meaningful to you to tweak it a little bit, it still would be great if you didn't change it. But if you have to, 
you have to. Um, um, but make sure that if you change it, you've done so with great thought. And you've hopefully done so that you can change it enough, um, but it's still very, very close to the original conceptual definition. Um, and nobody really wants you to go out and say, oh, here I have 10, people run with you. I like, I have 10 new things for our performance improvement program. I'm going to run away. And it's like, go, oh, go away. Pick one or two that really seem meaningful to you. Um, one, start one. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, the, the field really right now is there's a tremendous push for outcome measures. And I... I'm a process person, so this is part of my bias, but that I really, many of our measures are more process focused because that's where we are scientifically in the field. Um, at the same time, shared outcomes sometimes in palliative care are tough. You know, relieve your pain. Well, I want to have a little pain so I can be a little bit more awake. Does that mean I'm getting bad quality care? It's no, I made a choice about how I wanted my time to be. Um, so we, we really get kind of hung up on some of our national benchmarks. It's, it's problematic, but we need work in our outcomes, and we also need to not forget some of our process outcome, our process indicators are also very important. Um, many of these draw very heavily on the work of uh, Dr. Laura Hansen at UNC, and she has graciously connected um, and provided a lot of advice to the Measuring What Matters panel and participated in a lot of our, our meetings um, and has a very terrific hot link website that have the measures on them, as well as Institute for Healthcare, Healthcare Improvement, IHI, Hospital Improve, Healthcare Improvement. Um, they have a terrific how to start a, a performance improvement project or how to make your performance improvement projects a little bit more robust. Um, their um, online availability of resources is really very helpful. Um, for those of you who have experienced with, with um, hospice, the hospice item consolidated measure is under review. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like yet, but um, it will probably have some of the shared data elements that it already has. Um, the last two hospice items that are hospice item set um, has convergence with what came up with measuring what matters and treatment preferences and uh, whether spiritual concerns were addressed or not. So start with what you already have to do to not make work for yourself. Um, so we just, um, Rochester was the first academic health center, um, I think the third center overall to be certified in advanced um, JACO advanced palliative care program. So we just had our recertification. Um, and so what I can tell you now is any two measures are permissible from, from the measuring what matters list, so JACO is very happy with them. Right now they're not mandating, but they see that there is a real opportunity with two to four measures in the measuring what matters list to begin to use these uh, to really systematically allow um, some comparison nationally across uh, advanced uh, hospital, hospital, palliative care programs moving toward advanced certification. Um, so I'll mention, um, if you think about, I'm backing out again, I'm backing out from the specifics and into a little bit more of the broader conceptual issues again, is when you look at the top and you go clockwise, I just like to check. Um, these set priorities and goals, right? The National Consensus Project really had set those for us. We develop and test measures. Gosh, we aren't on. We have been doing that as investigators and researchers for a really long time. We have a really lack skill set. It's not the skill set of the Measuring What Matters subcommittee, um, but we can begin to evaluate those. Um, and really where we are in this phase is we've endorsed and harmonized measures. And as we look um, to our work, it is to begin to develop um, uh, health information technical standards. Um, and I think I got the acronym wrong, but it's to, 
to develop systematic specifications on what each data point are and how we will collect them and how they may be embedded into electronic medical record. Um, we have two new people really leading the charge on that, Lisa Lindley from Tennessee and Arif Kamal from Duke. Um, and they have tremendous, thankfully, um, they have tremendous expertise in uh, EMRs. Not my total forte. I swear a lot when I work with our, I'm not going to say the name, um, but most people do swear when they're working with their electronic record. Um, but we want to be able to find the data once it's put in, right? What, is it all always in the same place? Um, so as we move, we are not to a place where there's public reporting. We are not to a place where there's national benchmarks established. Will we get to that place? We might. Is it going to feel coercive? Probably. But are we going to want a voice at that table or are we going to want someone else to be driving the bus? And I think most people feel like they'd rather be sort of on the bus, driving the bus, rather than being run over by the bus. Um, so doing this work has not been without its creative tensions, also known as arguments uh, or fights or disagreements. Pretty some of them heated, um, but again, here's where your palliative care and ethics expertise comes to the fore. You can have these conversations that are difficult. People can remind ourselves of what our shared goals are. So I mentioned a little something about process and outcome. Um, it is a real big tension. Drop the process measures. They don't mean anything. It's like, what do you mean? They're, they're meaningful. Sometimes they're the best we have. We don't want to throw out. What's, what's better than nothing? Um, so that um, has been an issue. So this is another issue. Do we only really care about um, the quality of care that we deliver in our system to those people who are actually receiving specialty palliative care or hospice care? Or do we extend outside of those populations to people who are receiving general care? Um, and if we extend out, who are the people that we extend out to? And, and if we extend out to those people that we think would benefit from this, who's really going to be like, you know, we're going to be walking around. Who's going to be shooting the bullets at us from afar when we're really beginning to move into someone else's turf about how they may care for the symptoms that the patients may be having, right? So this requires um, a fair amount of careful consideration about, gosh, you know, most of us think, I shouldn't say that, half of us think, um, and this is actually very split, um, that really we need to focus on our own house, we need to focus on the patients we care for and have responsibility for. Another half of the people really that were, have this argument is, it doesn't matter if we see them. If we have patients in our organization, our institution that have unmet palliative care needs, we need to do something. The whole institution is the institution being evaluated, we need to be a part of that. Um, so some groups have been very open to collaboration. Um, in our own organization, the oncology group, tremendously open. Um, some of the other groups, verbally open, but when any sort of thing moves to action, a little less so, right? And there's some work that maybe needs to be done and maybe there's one possibly small shared measure that we can start with, something low-hanging fruit that's not threatening, um, to really begin to build this kind of collaboration across the institution. Um, perfection or pragmatism. I was just in a meeting last week and somebody said, wow, I mean, I, there are all these problems with this, and she kind of went on and on. And I'm like, okay. And um, I went back to don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is a step forward in a good direction, it's not perfect. And I, I keep looking at each other, I'm like, oh, it, because in particular, a big gap is the pediatric world. Not that the domains are not important and not that the domains are not um, similar in a lot of ways, but most of the measures that we looked at, the vast majority have been used on adults. Um, and have an adult focus and also, you know, you start looking in palliative care, your patients lose capacity, older adults 
um, they might not have the capacity to talk. We use surrogates, we use parents. The complexity of gathering data that's reliable that you want to build your program changes around gets really high when people are so sick. Um, it, when we talk about this at national meetings, I, I think that um, it felt like the top, like 15% of the people are like, oh my gosh, you guys are so slow. You're like a tortoise. The field is moving way out here. And you're like plodding along, doing these consensus measures, blah, blah, blah. And um, we're just really, you're too slow. You're too slow. You're too slow. Speed it up. Speed it up. This should have been out a year ago. This should have been out six months ago. Um, we thought we were going at a pretty good pace. On the other end, I can't believe you're doing this. I'm a palliative care clinician. My, it's an art. It's not a science. Don't be measuring quality. You cannot measure quality, right? You cannot measure what I do with these. And it's like, you know, you're right. I can't. These are indicators of quality. These are agreed upon things that we think all organizations should do and should have. But these aren't total picture of quality and your practice, your phronesis, your being in the setting and to be able to know how to do this, that is quality. We don't have that yet. We know it sometimes when we see it. I'm like, oh, that's quality. Oh, that's not. Um, but we, but it's, it's absolutely true. But we can't throw away um, the pieces that we, just because um, it doesn't, capture the whole experience. Um, and people are very afraid of accountability and benchmarks. So when I say benchmarks, oh, we don't have them. You know, 80% of our people should, 90% of our people should. We use our own cutoff in our own organization, usually somewhere around 95%. The person who was mad at me last week was like, what about the other 5%? Don't they matter? And one of those 5% happened to be her husband. And he had a horrible experience. My heart was breaking. And, you know, it is... What is our cutoff going to be? Do we spend this much time trying to go from 95 to 100, or do we take this other measure and really develop a plan where we're only 40%? Um, and we are really not pushing the needle very much on um, dyspnea. Or do we, you know, it's like, um, so, so those are very clear, very active tensions that you have. Um, hospice or palliative care, again, where should these predominantly sit? Um, the hospice item set is different. Um, and, but all of these measures, in some ways, they're in a morphing stage. They're in transition. So what measuring what matters really, I think, is attempting to do is begin to morph this in ways that are meaningful for patients and families. Um, and then the last thing we really heard it, uh, as the nurse on the committee, um, one of the nurses, actually, there are a whole bunch of nurses on the committee. We heard it from our social worker and chaplain friends. Uh, this is way too medical model focused. I work in palliative care. You have nothing. It's like, well, we have, did a person have a spiritual assessment? Well, great. You know, you need more robust um, cultural um, measures. You need more robust spiritual measures. You need more robust social measures. And that's absolutely true. And the more the robust measures that we have or the most robust measures that we have of things that are actionable for clinicians to do fall into the medical domain, you know. And I say medical, I should, the medical and nursing, the clinical domain, right? Um, and some of the other things are very difficult to measure. They're very important. They're very meaningful. But sometimes as someone who's working with patients, they're harder to affect, um, so, so that's, that's one of those other creative tensions. Um, so the, as we move forward, we came forward with, um, three additional recommendations. There's a paper that should come out soon in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, um, looking at some of the challenge, the research opportunities and challenges. And one really is as a field, we don't have a denominator. Um, we fake it, and we, we have specific subpopulation denominators that are helpful, but we need to begin to agree on who it is that might benefit from palliative care. Um, we really struggle. We have people using uh, 
iPad apps, data is going directly into their big performance improvement database that is linked to a repository that they get monthly reports from. And then we have people going around with a clipboard and a piece of paper. Um, so really, how can we speak to the broad variety of audiences that we might have? Um, and again, the need to further develop uh, patient reported outcome indicators. Um, so in closing, I want to open this up for questions. It, um, it's been a terrific, it's been a terrific ride, so to speak, not to. Um, um, and if you're not involved in performance improvement, thought, oh, that's never me. I would say absolutely get in, get on the bus, get in the car, um, because it's our opportunity to make a real big difference to to highlight the things that are important to patients and families on all the quality dashboards. In addition to the things that are important to our payers, in addition to the things that are important to other stakeholders in our organization. So. Thank you. So we have, Vanna's got her mic. Any questions? Okay, I finished early so that you guys would have, you know, oh, okay, good. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much, Sally. Thanks. Um, one question that's one of your tensions up there between sort of the palliative care specialty specific measurement versus your hospital or health system. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious that if we're measuring our, our own stuff for our palliative care service, we can add things to the record. We can pull charts. We can mm -hmm. do stuff. Can you tell us about places that have sort of gone for sort of the bigger uh, health system or hospital, and how do you actually manage to get the ability to measure some of these things across a health system rather than within a specific service? Okay, that's a great question. I think um, it, at the risk of being wrong, um, it's common enough, um, is one of the organizations where I think they're doing a really nice job is Pittsburgh. And what Pittsburgh has done um, is begin to partner with different specialty groups within the organization. It's not the entire system, but that is the goal, um, to sort of say to cardiology, tell me how you would, and I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I remember from a meeting, so tell me how you, would re, how you would classify somebody who ought to be in a palliative care denominator. Give me any criteria that you want to use for to cardiology, right? Let cardiology set those criteria, even if you don't totally agree with them. If you can come to a shared set of this is the group that we want to help you with. Um, and the same with oncology. And if, if they have that control to sort of say, well, um, because if you set the criteria, you're going to go in there and they're like, oh, that's not, that patient's not palliative care eligible. You know, go away. Go somewhere else. Um, but if they set the criteria, then you can sort of say, gosh, this patient is the person that, um, that we talked about. And then where we've had a fair amount of success is once that conceptual work has happened is to have the teams, the quality teams in a hospital, um, you know, ONC has their quality, cardiology has, is to begin to mesh with the quality teams and see if there is a space, usually it's small, it's like one item, maybe it's treatment preferences, uh, or naming of a surrogate. Um, that is not particularly threatening. It doesn't feel like, um, you know, you're going to come in and manage dyspnea and heart failure. Um, so naming of a surrogate is often a place where we have shared agreement. People are like, oh, yeah, well, I can see why that could be very helpful. And, and from there, it can grow. Um, but it has been not a system-wide kind of thing. It has been, you know, neighbor to neighbor, group to group, uh, neighborhood to neighborhood kind of, you know, this group is friendly. And start with your friends. Um, that, you know, we always talk about low-hanging fruit. Don't start with the people who hate you. Um, start with the people who are friendliest to you um, because you're going to get it wrong, they're going to get it wrong, you're going to have some bumps, and you will work it out. But um, sometimes it's very hard to get second chances with some of the people who are not friendly to you. Um, so that would be my general advice. People think, oh, they have the biggest problem. That's me saying, the surgical intensive care has the biggest problem in the hospital or the transplant service or oncology or, and, and A, I've just 
called them out and said they don't deliver good quality care. So they're annoyed at me already. Um, whereas if I go to somebody who is doing that work, I can say, you know, you guys are doing a fantastic job. I know you call us a lot. I'm wondering if you would be ever think about collaborating with us on a, a performance improvement project for some of your heart failure patients. Um, so when, um, and I can't remember, maybe somebody remembers where it was published, there was a um, sort of cross-sectional look about how many patients might be eligible for palliative care in an inpatient setting at any given time versus how many patients were seen by palliative care. Huge gap. But it doesn't mean you can take their criteria and say, you know, these are all the patients that we want to measure or we want to sort of make sure that we're delivering. But those organizations want to deliver good quality care too, and they like when you give them an instrument that's simple and that you've done some legwork on and that you talk to them about and you're going to help partner with them by doing some chart reviews with them. Um, and then, gosh, you know, we have a fellow who's interested in picking up this project um, who might be willing to kind of come by, you know, if there's anybody you want us to talk to um, or how to talk to people about uh, naming a surrogate. Um, there's a lot of ways to sort of offer your help. Um, but And sometimes you're not wanted and you know, it's okay. Call me when somebody else comes breathing down your neck about the need to improve quality, and then we'll be here. We would love to work with you. Um, Lucia, you had a question? So I'm going to um, ask for your advice. I was listening to your talk and reflecting on the work that needs to happen in ethics consultation. Mm -hmm. in terms of process measures and outcome measures. And, and a lot of people argue that ethics consultation has changed dramatically with the increase in palliative care services. And I guess I'd, I'd like your thoughts on um, if we were going to look at the impact of ethics consultation, if we were going to measure quality of that based on the lessons that you've learned in your Measuring What Matters project, what, what advice do you have for how we can look at um, how we care for those patients for whom there's a request for ethics? Um, it's a kind of a complicated question. Um, no, I mean, here, so here are like some general thoughts. Uh, where I see palliative care is less threatening than ethics be, and less, um, because there is a discrete thing that can maybe be handed off to palliative care. Um, it's like, oh, you know, help them with goals of care, where that is seen as something that helps make my job more efficient. Um, if I'm the attending, right? So I see a time benefit. I see a way to sort of sell it as well. You know, they're coming in, they're helping with um, patient goals of care and treatment. When ethics comes in, it's a threat. It's, we're saying that, um, you know, there is an ethical issue. We all think we should be able to handle the ethical issues and we struggle with that. So there's automatically, you know, we don't want to call ethics, we'll call palliative care, because palliative care has a clinical bent, um, and ethics um, doesn't necessarily have that clinical bent. So they're seen as different kind of entities. And then I think ethics has been, um, and, and, and I don't want to say here, but what kind of database have you developed, right? Um, people really haven't wanted to develop databases. Um, what kind of consults do you get from whom? We began to see, I, I sort of, I see patterns, right, um, everywhere. We, the third or fourth or fifth time, we saw someone come in who has a developmental disability, ward of the state. Um, we don't have any guidelines. Um, and we want, there is a question about, they have very advanced metastatic, uh, carcinomatosis and they're still in active treatment and they don't have a guardian because guardian are expensive to make. So, so those kinds of data collection, what kind of consults are we getting, where are we getting them from, uh, what are the key issues, allow people to see patterns and then develop their own performance issues. But some of the things that we see are idiosyncratic to the patient. But if you think about your ethics service, what are the patterns that you see? Who's in those patterns? What units are in those patterns? What's similar? Um, is it we're going to develop a guideline, a recommend, a set of kind of typical practices, not that people have to follow, but that are helpful in um, these kind of cases when someone comes in 
who really is at the end of their life and really does not have a guardian and is a ward of the state. Um, so, so it's the beginning of what's important, what are the salient variables for, um, for ethics to develop. And I'm not sure as a field that, that ethics has moved in that direction. It's been much more case-based um, and then philosophically driven and less um, evidence-based. Um, one of the things that I find incredibly helpful, how many of the patients that you're called for ethics consultation have capacity? It's pretty easy, but it matters. How many have a surrogate, named surrogate versus non-named surrogate? How many are for family um, disruption or family disagreement or disagreement between the clinic? You could begin to categorize and make variables out like, oh, disagreement between the main attending and the family member. Um, but we haven't yet. We haven't done that as a field. Other thoughts or questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I very appreciate the opportunity to talk with you.